Um, so what I um, want to start out uh, uh, with is sort of like a, uh, a very broad question, you know, what is agency? Um, and obviously, when you when you read, uh, let's say, the philosophy of action literature on it, uh, you know, there are many answers. Um, um, but I think for the purpose of today's talk, I want to motivate a certain angle um, and that's the following, you know, and I, I'll start with this little, um, you know, uh, story here where a big fish, you know, is swimming uh, in, in the ocean and meeting these two younger folks. Um, and, and, and the big older fish is asking the question, how's the water? Um, and the two younger, um, you know, folks are kind of startled, don't know what to say. And once the older, you know, fish is out of sight, one of the younger fish dares, dares to ask the, the question, what the hell is water? Um, and I, I think this is, a, a, you know, a, a powerful way to think about agency. Why? Because when we think about behavioral economics, right, one of the core insights is obviously the pervasiveness of context effects, right? But uh, not just of context effects, but of context effects in decision-making processes that we're not aware of. And I think what agency, or at least an aspect of agency is, is becoming aware of those um, context effects that are so pervasive, basically becoming aware of the water in which we swim. Now, um, and I think this is obviously, you know, starting out with now more and more seriously, you know, what the literature has been saying on this, that a core challenge to standard wealth economics is obviously exactly those you know, context effects. They can be material, situational, social, uh, and they really pose, a, a, you know, a, an intricate problem to standard wealth, uh, wealth economics. And, you know, in, in behavioral wealth economics, there's this so-called reconciliation problem, right? That um, how can we um, basically reconcile, you know, uh, doing wealth economics uh, that then leads to behavioral public policy with these behavioral insights? And um, the literature, uh, you know, is, is vast on how to solve this reconciliation problem. And by and large, one could say, you know, preference-based criteria um, are fraught with epistemic and ontological difficulties. When we go down the preference-based route and, and say, okay, we still want to uphold, um, you know, uh, choice-based or preference-based criteria when doing welfare analysis, we run into problems. Now, some authors has, uh, have argued we can solve them. Others say, you know, they're so intricate, we shouldn't choose preference-based criteria. Obviously, Robert Sugden is uh, the most prominent um, critic of preference-based preference -based criteria. And he thinks we should do wealth economics in a behavioral world without uh, making any um, reference to preferences. Now, um, Bob has obviously uh, suggested the opportunity-based, uh, you know, approach to um, behavioral wealth economics. Um, and I have written on, on, on that and, and, and gently criticized him uh, for him not taking seriously enough the context effects when, when, when going down the opportunity-based route. The talk today won't be on that. Uh, what I want to focus on is this burgeoning literature on agency-centric behavioral public policy. Uh, and, you know, Sanjayan presented last week, uh, or not last week, the last, you know, seminar in, in this series on agency. Um, and uh, it, it, it's an interesting literature and the literature, and Sean is obviously also here in today's talk. Um, I've written with Paul a, a recent paper on that, um, but also the whole boosting literature is by and large in this agency-centric BPP. Now, it's um, a, uh, uh, a literature that doesn't have one idea of agency, but it's basically united in, in, the, in the critique of approaches in behavioral public policy that assume the behavioral outcomes um, or outcome targets um, and uh, basically then exploit cognitive biases to realize those behavioral outcomes. Okay, so that's um, by and large one of the main points of criticism that this literature has, the agency-centric literature, and basically in one form or, or another they all appeal to and and want to foster people's reasoning capacities. Now, not like the old philosophers have, you know, always appealed to people's reasoning capacities, but by taking behavioral insights seriously, right? Uh, taking psychological insights seriously and say, can we still 
boost or foster people's reasoning capacities vis-a-vis -vis those uh, context effects that are so pervasive. Now, the argument, um, and, and I probably won't uh, cover everything in detail, but the argument that I have in mind is the following, right? The first point is, why does behavioral economics motivate an agency perspective? And, and, and one core aspect is that there's the knowledge problem. And I would call this the old knowledge problem of welfareist approaches in behavioral public policy, such as nudging. How do we know what the true preference is um, of, of people towards which we can nudge them? Um, now, there's also an interesting experimental literature actually that shows, and this is the second bullet point um, here, um, that people value being in control of their own choices beyond the welfare outcome of those choices, right? And what that says is obviously what classical liberals have always uh, are, are always adamant to point out that uh, you know autonomy matters um, beyond the welfare consequences. Uh, and um, you know there is a, a literature on that. I won't cover that, but I think it motivates that um, agency perspective, um, and it's quite a different motivation from the typical. Um, you know, system one nudging um, literature. Now, how to think about agency and behavioral public policy? Um, I think a core distinction here is between processes and outcome considerations. And I have a, a slide that will cover, cover that. And the prominent agency enhancing interventions, AEIs that I um, discussed um, today are assistive queuing and boosts. I think there are epistemic challenges that haven't been uh, covered in the literature um, sufficiently enough, um, and particularly two aspects um, stand out. The one is that this literature on agency is often motivated by, hey, we really want to understand actual reasoning processes, and we really want to identify when those processes break down. And obviously, if, if that is your aspiration, well, that's a high epistemic burden for, for policymaking. And I think, and this is um, a, a point that I've been recently thinking about, apart from these epistemic challenges, I think they're conceptual problems uh, with um, particularly the boosting approach, but also the assistive queuing approach. If that is your approach, it's a rather narrow approach to um, autonomy or agency enhancing um, interventions. And I think the, the blind spot here is that they really focus on competence and not autonomy. And I, I hope I can convince you towards the end of my talk that this is what I'm uh, about to do. And this is more the explorative part of, of my talk today. Now, okay, how to think about agency. Um, this is uh, an illustration actually by um, a colleague of mine at Pomona, um, Shlomi Sher, uh, with Greg McKenzie, they 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 often have this illustration. I think it's it's helpful to think about um, the difference between you know outcome facilitation and interventions that aim at outcomes such as nudging, um, and process facilitation interventions such as boost and assist assistive queuing. Now, boost typically try by you know appealing to simple heuristics, for example, improve the quality of cognitive operations, how you basically deal with given information. And assistive queuing would be, you know, we try to give people better information that then leads to a better process of decision making. And ultimately, we don't say in the boosting and, and, and assistive queuing intervention, we don't make any assumption what the correct outcome would be, the behavioral outcome. So we, we, and people who are in the agency enhancing intervention camp uh, want to address the, the, the process prior to choice and are not so much concerned with whatever people choose. Now, there are a bunch of advantages, I think, of this approach. Uh, you know, the nudging literature, and I, I won't go through these points because you're well aware of it, has certain problems. Um, and the, the process facilitation aspect, you know, has as its goal um, to enhance people's reasoning capacities. Now, just to give you a flavor of what these two interventions are, assistive queuing and boost, uh, assistive queuing is, is, is not such a well-known ter uh, term, but the idea is really to give people high quality information to enable correct inferences. And think about, you know, first example would be give uh, people, uh, when, when, when they sample let's say uh, loans, you know, interest, interest rates for loans, what you want to do is that the sample uh, that people have in front of them, you know, when they obviously they kind of go to all banks and get the the, the, the interest rates on, on, on all loans, but you want to have a representative sample where the mean that people sample reflects 
the mean of interest uh, rate loans in the market, right? And, and you try to uh, help people by giving them a representative sample to make correct inferences about what is the mean value of interest uh, rates in the law lo of loans in the market out there. A another example would be, you know, this whole literature that many of you are aware of uh, uh, on, on joint versus separate evaluations, right? When people are given, and you know, it could be a uh, job screening of job market candidates where, uh, you know, you have just two dimensions. One would be the GPA and the other one would be experience. You know, these are the two attributes um, um, and, and the information that you get about the candidates. And, and, and what the literature says is that, of course, GPA is the numerical value is very easy to compare across candidates, but experience is, is much harder. And uh, by and large, people uh, make more correct inferences. That's what the literature says when they are given uh, a joint evaluation of, um, you know, job market market candidates A and B, along those basically you see A and B and you see the GPA and the experience alongside each other and you do not see the values separate, right, for A and B uh, because um, that makes it much harder to compare A and B. So this is the idea, you know, it gives you a flavor of what assistive queuing is uh, and boosts, you know, this is obviously the well-known literature that Gerd Gigerenzer, um, Ralph Hertwig and others have been uh, working on, uh, where you try to uh, enhance people's decision-making competence by making use and appealing to people's decision-making heuristics, right? And just three examples. One would be, you know, uh, that's uh, the, the classic example to transform basically simple probability representations into natural frequencies that helps you uh, to overcome base rate neglect, for example, when making risk assessment. Another would be, you know, training people in temptation bundling where you bundle a want with a should activity and that ultimately leads to more should activities, right? Uh, should activities such as cleaning the house, uh, going to the gym, et cetera. Uh, and and, and the, the last one is, um, you know, teaching people in, in fast and frugal decision trees, uh, for example, you know, uh, doctors or, or, or nurses in the context of potential heart attacks or strokes where you do not screen, you know, the patient for all, potential uh, problems that the person has, but you look at certain salient cues that lead to, uh, um, you know, quite robust um, diagnostic um, uh, results. So this would be, you know, what uh, the, the boost literature is up to. And I think both, you know, the assistive cueing and, and the boost interventions, they, they have advantages over, over um, you know, the, the nudging of, approach. Uh, and Sanjay nicely addressed these points actually in, in our last seminar. So I, I won't go through them. Uh, so I think both in terms of, you know, um, you know, epistemic burden, but also in terms of how um, um, robust these interventions are, th there are certain advantages. Now, what are the problems? Okay, I think there are, there are a few problems. Uh, one is what I already uh, alluded to earlier on, that this literature, uh, particularly the literature on simple heuristics, but also the, the literature on assistive queuing says, we want to understand actual reasoning processes. And obviously that's quite different from the nudging approach that is actually built on the heuristics and biases um, uh, program that by and large relies on parametric extensions of the max u model. Um, and, uh, you know, in this literature, you could say, well, people behave as if they calculated, you know, their utilities, for example, in intertemporal choice based on this hyperbolic or quasi-hyperbolic function given on, on the slide. Now, the simple heuristics framework says, okay, we want to deal with actual decision-making uh, processes. And obviously, if that is your aspiration, uh, then obviously you have a much higher burden. Um, so that's the first entry point here when building your theories of, of decision making. Now, this is just to um, show, I, I think, in, in, in a bit more detail, what the you know policymakers that want to implement boosts, uh, what type of knowledge they would need. First, they would need, you know, to understand actual cognitive heuristics, uh, you know, that the human mind uses, then identify under which environmental conditions those heuristics work, and then how to convey this information in the form of teachable lessons to decision makers, right? So the idea would here be the right rule of thumb for the right environment. But you can already see that's a lot of knowledge that one would need to acquire for all sorts of contexts and decision environments. And, and for assistive cues, I think um, that's a, laud a laudable approach. But here again, you need to have knowledge as uh, you know, a policy analyst of the signals that an environmental cues convey, 
you know, called inf information leakage, the specific cognitive heuristics that they trigger, you know, how this is absorbed in the decision maker's mind, and whether salient information is, is ultimately relevant information. And here, one could say, you know, the knowledge is the right information in the right form for the right environment. Now, I'm not saying these are bad approaches. I'm just saying these are high epistemic burdens, okay? And a big danger here is you still sort of have a micro-interventionist uh, approach, uh, and I, I call this, you know, micro-interventionist in, in quotation marks. In both cases, there's a danger of miscalibration, uh, you know, when you, when you basically think about what type of boost or what type of assistive cues work, if the uh, the, uh, the environment is dynamically changing, right? Uh, and both, this is uh, a huge danger. Uh, and, you know, people um, such as Giga Renser, Hertwig, Tilkun, Yanov have acknowledged this point, but I think it's, it's a serious point. Um, now, the other point, and this is, I, I think, a deeper conceptual problem with, with this ap approach is, um, one could, you know, differentiate the, the heuristics and biases literature and the simple heuristics literature, um, with um, basically the, the following that the um, traditional behavioral economics literature is still the uh, algebraic approach uh, and level of analysis. The simple heuristic approach is, uh, and this is their terminology, this is Tilkun Yanov's terminology, uh, wants to uh, go down the algorithmic route uh, and separate the motivating from the epistemic factors when we analyze decision-making processes. Now, what is the motivating, what is the epistemic factor? Think about discounting the future. Uh, and when we discount the future, obviously there are motivating factors and the epistemic components when we make a choice. Now, motivating factors could be things such as uncertainty about the future, psychological discomfort of deferring instant gratification. You know, these are intrinsic, quote unquote, good motivating factors why we of valid motivating factors, why we uh, discount the future. But there's a host of epistemic factors, let's say the lack of ability to imagine one's older self. Uh, and this is an old you know, quote from Pigou here on, on, on the slide. And the idea would be when we help people to make better decisions in an intertemporal choice, we want to differentiate these two levels and ultimately help people overcome the epistemic distorting components of decision-making. And of course, this differentiation is, is very difficult uh, um, since both aspects always um, are at play uh, and, and other potential co uh, confounding factors. And, I, and there's this great overview article on intertemporal choice by Frederick and, 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 and co-authors uh, that really nicely show how tricky that is. Now, what I want to do in the last few minutes is apart from saying, you know, what are the epistemic problems um, in, in, in these approaches? What are the conceptual problems? Um, I think it's the one-sided focus on competence. I think um, when we look at, um, you know, the boosting literature and also the assistive cueing literature, ultimately what they want to do is rectify epistemic problems in means and calculations. Uh, and this is sort of a stylized way to think about it. Basically, choose the right means from a set of means for a given goal. And if you're boosted, you will choose with a higher likelihood the right means for a given goal. Um, now, of course, you know, being competent definitely contributes to people's sense of agency, right? It enhances the experience of self-efficacy, you know, and also of the, um, you know, sense of effectiveness and mastery. Um, and competence is clearly important for agency. Think about statistical literacy in a medical um, decision-making context. You know, you as a um, patient uh, have a higher sense of agency if you are actually statistically literate, right? But it misses a crucial aspect, and that I think is a, a very important. And the literature on self-determination, uh, the psychological literature makes this point very clear, and that's autonomy. Uh, and what is autonomy? Well, it's it, it sort of, and this is, um, you know, uh, Ryan and DC, you know, the two main authors in, the, in this literature say, the experience of volition and willingness when one's action, thoughts, and feelings are self-endorsed and authentic. Um, and I think that's so important. Why? Because roughly speaking, in the literature, this means... Uh, not whether people are just competent in choosing your know, means for a given goal, but do people actually have the ability and means to choose the goal mm. from a set of goals that is actually self-endorsed and authentic? Um, and I think this is a very important po um, 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 aspect that actually John Stuart Mill, for example, uh, was adamant in, in pointing out. Now, 
the uh why is this point uh important think about you know successful bo boosting and assistive uh, uh queuing they do not guarantee that the competent the competencies that people acquire will be used for goals you know for the selection of goals that are actually non-alienating and authentic think about a workaholic well a workaholic and by the way, very smart undergrad students are, are also very competent often. You know, they may be uh, more successful in satisfying their craving due to uh, acquired competencies and, and the competency to achieve something can motivate a person to do it even, I mean, to do this activity that they are competent in, even if they do not uh, value, um, you know, striving for that goal upon reflection. Um, and uh, in that sense, uh, and, and, and by the way, you know, being boosted and acquiring uh, competence in a certain area often leads to very narrow vision, right? And, and, and neglect actually of the opportunity costs of the activity that people are uh, undertaking. And in this sense, boosting does not necessarily promote autonomy. It only contributes to choices being made in the right uh, and right here in the, uh, in the sense of means and sufficient way. Now, um, why is autonomy and, and Adam just two three more minutes and then I'm done okay uh, why is autonomy in the form of recent self-endorsement an issue at all and I think they and think about back you know the the, the fish example the metaphor that I gave you uh, in the beginning um, if we um, take behavioral e uh, economics insights seriously the selection of the goals out of a set of goals is of course socially conditioned right um, and uh, if that's the case, you know, the question is, what could be a constructive approach, an alternative approach that is agency, you know, takes agency seriously, but is not going down the micro interventionist route. Um, and I think here this quote by Marcia Sen is, is important. If, if you want to take agency seriously, uh, there's a deep complementar uh, complementarity between individual agency and social ar arrangements. It is important to give simultaneous recognition to the centrality of, of freedom and to the forces of social influence. And, and I think this idea of studying social influences upon individual decision-making processes is surprisingly, I mean, it's obviously studied in behavioral economics. Uh, think about you know, conformity, think about the, how uh, social norms play out, et cetera, how group identities play out in, in, in decision-making processes. But surprisingly, um, I find the literature in BPP not uh, robustly informed exactly by this aspect on uh, the aspect of focusing on the on the social aspect and the social influences on decision making processes. And um, there is a, a recent nice overview article um, in the Oxford Handbook of, of Self Determination that um, says uh, that basically empirically looks at social conditions for you know people ha having a perceived sense of autonomy and competence uh, and they uh, say you know there's certain institutional arrangements that are particularly um, um, conducive to people's perceived um, co competence and autonomy and I just want to highlight two aspects here and I think this is an alternative uh, route that behavioral public policy could take uh, and being informed by behavioral economics that is not going down the boosting or assistive queuing route and, and this is, you know, to study the social institutions that lead to people's sense of um, autonomy and competence. And what um, Ryan and Dehan say in the overview article is, you know, when you look at that empirically, you see that um, institutions that guarantee people, you know, basic freedoms, um, think about freedom of movement, expression, occupation, freedom for discrimination, et cetera, but also resources such as basic income, social security, education, healthcare, transport, community and trust, et cetera, um, that ultimately lead to a higher um, perceived sense of autonomy and competence. Uh, but it's a very different approach from the boosting or nudging approach. And I think um, uh, you know, Sean obviously is a, a, a person who has, has written on on on. on this um, uh, perspective of on uh, behavioral public policy. Um, and I think, you know, Sean's approach uh, could be enriched by taking some more um, empirical insights in of this literature uh, on self-determination um, uh, more seriously. That's it um, for, you know, just an, an input. I think that there's enough uh, food for, for, for thought and I'm looking forward to, to the discussion.
questions. Okay. Okay. So I think you all know the drill. So um, I've already started. So if you put your virtual hand up, um, I'll take questions in in the order in which you raise them. So Bob, you're first. Um, your microphone. Uh, you're muted, Bob. So. Um, sorry. Yes. Um, Multiple, we've had this argument many, many times before, but uh, it seems to me that there's a, you know, going on this uh, Daisy Ryan thought, it seems to me to be a big difference between when you say, ex you talk about on one hand, ex the experience of volition and competence, mm -hmm. which seems to me to be, uh, that's a first person thing, that's what you really experience, and mm -hmm. it's very easy to see why that would be an element of well-being and why people might want it. But the, this concept of the authentic and the self-endorsed feels to me to be to me very suspicious. Really, and I sort of thought of I mean, how do you know what's off? How do you know how? One hand, how do you know who who says this is authentic? You know, the, the person who's a workaholic <laughs> goes off to work. You, you know, someone else says, "Oh, this isn't an authentic desire. You really desire this. This is false consciousness." And the thought that, um, and I think the thought that self-endorsement is a a very rationalistic. Um, intellectualization of things. You think that um, you have the, ex the you have the this, you can have the experience of volition. You you're doing. You know. You feel you're choosing what you want. You feel that you feel competent about it. You feel that you know what you're doing. And someone else comes on and says, "Well, I think what you're wanting is not really authentic." And have you really endorsed it? And I and the man says, "Oh, like me." I said, "Well, no, I haven't. I, I've never thought about endorsing it. I'm not endorsing." It. And why? Why should I? I mean, so I think that you. I think that this you're slipping between a, an entirely legitimate first-person view of what of an idea of authenticity. I'm sorry, an idea of of autonomy as consciousness of, of volition, uh, consciousness of being control of controlling your life with a third party view, which is very, I mean, I don't know what you call it paternalistic, but it's certainly something a liberal would be worried about. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Bob. Um, now, obviously, and this is, you know, Messiah Berlin has, has pointed out that, ex that, you know, this idea of, you know, false consciousness and, and appealing to, you know, people's authentic desires obviously invites all sorts of uh, potentially not just paternalistic, but maybe, yeah. <laughs> you know, problematic policy interventions, um, because we, you know, you could justify and say, oh, people are not truly free, but yes, I, I, I actually know what, and then you, you go down the, you know, the communist gulag. I mean, I'm simplifying it, but Berlin yeah, was talking absolutely, about absolutely, that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so now, um, and I think, you know, that um, that's, that's an important concern. Now, the, what, what, what I, um, and, and also together with Paul, when we write on this, uh, on, on this topic is both the, um, you know, the psychological uh, concept of competence, but also the psychological concept of autonomy are subjective categories, right? So ultimately, you know, what you do in these, you know, and these are these, you know, batteries of, of, of um, questions, you know, DC and Ryan and their, in, in their empirical analysis um, um, would, would, would employ are, you know, obviously questions that are uh, addressed to people, you know, uh, to the workaholic, for example, that you that you uh, alluded to, would be, hey, of course you can ask the workaholic, how competent do you feel, you know, when you do, I don't know, uh, your trading, if if you are sort of like uh, working at the stock market, or you know, professors who really work, how competent are you in solving, you know, uh, the puzzle mm -hmm. in front of you, etc. You can ask that, and people, you know, give different answers. But of course, you could also um, with the same sort of approach, ask people, you know, how um, how much do you identify actually with the goal that you're pursuing? I mean, that's a subjective um, question. You're alluding to people's subjective stance on on a certain issue, and obviously, and this is, uh, and I know you're not a fan of the self determination literature, um, but what the literature uh, says is, you know, the, these basic psychological concepts, and they call it psychological needs, right, of competence and autonomy are distinct categories and they're separate from each other, but they're both um, foundational to 
um, to you know psychological well-being broadly construed, right? And the absence of let's say problems such as depression, anxiety, etc. Um, and in that sense, and I think it's very important and um, to 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 really highlight the subjective notion in both of these dimensions um, as psychological categories. Um, and I think really the idea of autonomy, and this is the last you know, point that I want to raise here, is, is obviously one, you know, this idea of authenticity um, is obviously a point that some classical liberals such as John Stuart Mill were quite worried about, right? Mm. Uh, um, and, and this idea that, I mean, he uses the metaphor of the tree, right? Uh, you know, the mm -hmm. tree that we all have in us, you know, grows organically and authentically, right? Whatever that means in your, in your context. Means he was not just worried about competence. Uh, and I would say, you know, some form of authenticity is, is actually a very liberal concern um, uh, in, you know, the tradition of classical um, liberal political economy. Yeah. Uh, that's, 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 that's correct. Yeah, I'll pass on. That's correct. It is yeah. liberal. It is a liberal form. I think it's an, it's uh, not necessarily the, the right, the best form of liberalism. But yeah. And and just one aspect, Bob, because I know you you raised this this point. What what I really think is important to move away from the idea of a rationalistic account of uh, of agency. I mean, that's uh, while you appeal to people's reasoning capacities, it's you know there's no need to assume you know a stable set of core preferences or rationality in any neoclassical sense because ultimately this would be this, a psychologically realistic and rich account of agency that is quite different from from a you know economistic account of agency okay um Kristen, you're next oh okay sorry i thought i was like third um so it's kind of a, maybe a bit more high level or kind of more of a comment. And multi, this actually um, ties into a sort of exactly a thing I had read recently about Camus and kind of being tied into social norms is, um, it's kind of the issue of autonomy versus I think freedom. Like you just mentioned uh, autonomy is a bit subjective. And I kind of, I wonder sometimes when we think of increasing someone's autonomy and if it is perceived autonomy, that falls in, I think, related to the self-efficacy sort of uh, point. And with self-efficacy, people can have this high kind of perceived self-efficacy, but not be able to actually implement their choice. So really, it's just a perception. It's You can do this through a lot of different ways. I think you kind of alluded to that a bit with the Stuart Mills quote and something you, you, know, you encounter in behavioral change. Um, so if you're trying to increase that it's not really achieving any goal really for the person but when you compare I just feel like with a lot of these conversations when we think about increasing autonomy uh, it's really about increasing people's freedom but the freedom is being limited so much by the social norms by the time factors um by just life itself so in I guess in a way what I'm saying is kind of what is the goal in in the end is it to make people think they have more choice and power over their choice is it to enable them to to enact whatever their choice is and their preference will change or is it to give them more freedom which is inherently limited by the time the technology the environment that they're in and is kind of a utopian idea at the extreme that anyone could have all the freedom so I was trying to kind of mix a little bit from the kind of the very practical psychology sort of intervention going up very high to this uh, to the site, you know, philosophy. So apologies if it's a bit convoluted, but um, and I think that's sometimes where I get a bit lost with this is yeah. wanting to help the people and where, yeah, where are we going kind of with that? Because then I can understand more, okay, where, where are the issues and how do you make that work? And where is the kind of the concerns about like third party intervention? So yeah. hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, and and I, I I think there's a lot, obviously, in, in your question, but I want to focus yeah. on, <laughs> and I think what I consider to, to be the, um, a core problem, um, and that is the tension between, if you go down a, a subjectivist route, um, on, you know, basically 
on autonomy, competence, etc. Um, you obviously, and you you say, oh, we really want to take the subjectivist criterion seriously in, in, in public policy making. Obviously, you could, in theory, end up with a whole set of policies that make people believe that they have a higher sense of autonomy and competence. But on a philosophically rich account of autonomy and competence, it's actually, you know, not not in any meaningful sense, uh, competence um, uh, and particularly yeah. autonomy, right? So you made people believe, and and in, in fact, there's there's even literature. Uh, I just recently had a discussion with a colleague of mine. There's um, a, a literature that says when you don't tell people what the psychological mechanism is that you allude to when you you know, have a, let's say, default policy intervention. Ultimately, you get a higher buy-in than when you actually say, you know, defaults allude to people's status quo bias, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. people suddenly become much more critical of actually the uh, the policy. And you can clearly see, well, the latter actually would try to appeal to people's reasoning capacities, right? But ultimately leads to a lower sense of perceived autonomy, right? Uh, and, and, and that's a real that's a real conundrum, and I think uh, you know that uh, that you know policymakers have to deal with. But I think it's a conundrum that uh, you know taking sort of liberal uh, first principles seriously, uh, people should be on board with, and actually then go through a value of perceived lower autonomy that ultimately uh, leads to a higher sense of autonomy. But that's the very optimistic route. I think mm. that the bullet that one really has to bite um, is exactly the one that you're alluding to, that you could make people believe to have a higher sense of perceived autonomy, but it's actually not in any meaningful sense. Now, I want to uh, just um, uh, inject a positive uh, side note here. Um, when you read the literature, the empirical literature, uh, you know, and, and this overview article by by the Han and, and Ryan that I, I that I quoted early on, what you see is actually the type of macro social conditions and institutional environments that are conducive to a higher perceived sense of autonomy and competence are by and large institutions that are in line with classical liberal first principles, uh, you know, such as freedom of mobility, freedom of expression, uh, you know, um, et cetera. And, and, and these are, you know, uh, not the type of, oh, we trick people into doing certain things and making them believe that they, they have a higher sense of competence. And I think that's encouraging that when you go down the subjectivist route and take that as a foundation for your thinking on agency, you actually end up with an endorsement of the type of liberal institutions that are in line with, you know, liberal commonsensical normative principles and i think that's that's important now this is you know always open to refutation <laughs> i don't know how the future will be and and you know when we allude to ai and all sort of things we could obviously and you know no six you could say agency uh machine not the experience machine but you can plug people in and and, and make them feel a higher sense of agency I, I think that's always the danger with any subjectivist notion um in in, in policy making but i think it's sort of the bullet that I'm willing to bite, normatively speaking, uh, mm -hmm. to avoid actually the concerns that Bob has uh, in being sort of a rationalistic paternalist uh, in policy making. Okay. Um, hi, Hajo. You had your hand up. Hi. Do you want to come in? Because uh, this is one of the few times I've seen you with a, out of uniform recently. So, uh, oh. <laughs> to um, give you the opportunity to come in there. Do you want to come in? Come on. That's your question. Come on. No, I, I kept trying to write down the way I wanted to ask it, and I wasn't satisfied that my question made any sense. So I put my hand down until I could type it okay, in a way. Yeah, think about it then. Okay, you'll have to think about it. Okay, fine. Uh, Paul. Uh, hi, Malt. Uh, this is the second time I'm seeing your presentation, so I'm, I'm getting into the groove of how you think a little bit more. Um, I basically I have a high-up question and a low-up question. The low-up question is, what do you sort of take as the basic data for individuals? So with many of your questions, what I would want to go to is almost a neuroscientific understanding of how thought processes are. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of start with what psychologists think of in their categories. I'd, I'd be more thinking of um, you know, self-perception in terms of, okay, where's that in the brain? And we know quite a bit about you know, the, the mapping, how people see themselves in space, notions of territory, notions of others. Um, mimicking neurons in terms of how we learn from others, but also our models uh, of how others are. 
And so to a certain extent, my basic data would be different from yours if I were tackling these kind of questions. Um, and then so my other question is, well, how do you want to interact with the various groups in society, which in a way are already practicing a lot of the things that you are sort of interested in? So, uh, but, but you use entirely different language, right? So there's, for instance, an old field and, uh, about socialization, um, about pedagogy. And they basically ask very similar questions as yours. You know, how do we get people to be procedurally better? How do we get them to recognize their outcome? Um, the mental health literature is full of this sort of stuff for the last 50 years, but really working on stuff that's been around for centuries. Also, when it comes to social intelligence, uh, how companies operate, how bureaucracies operate, there's a lot of institutional knowledge as to what works to sort of um, prevent particular mistakes in particular circumstances. So we have the notion of debate, the notion of different perspectives, challenge partners, rotation systems. In a sense, our society has deep learning on almost everything that you've talked about. Yeah. But in your idea, look, I want to set up an entirely different vocabulary because all these people are going to have no idea what you talk about. I mean, really, no idea. Is it kind of like, look, in 10 years' time, we're, there's going to be other people coming along, and then you know we, we go for the same rigmarole again, but just different words for the same stuff which again, are not gonna be known by anybody who practices this or who sort of works at this? Or do you want to connect to, as it were, the, the implementation world, which is huge? And if so, what, where, how, how are you gonna yeah. do that? Are you, are you gonna come up with new suggestions? You know, things they may try that they haven't otherwise thought of because they haven't made it abstract. Great, thanks, Paul. This, this is fantastic. Um, I, I'm, um... I want to spend more time on your on your letter question. Uh, that, you know, I think that's the high up question and, um, that mm -hmm. that you raise here, uh, because I, I have my doubts whether the neuroscientific route uh, on agency is so helpful. Uh, I, I've read a fair bit on that literature. I think it's, uh, I think it's ultimately, particularly for the type of discussions we have in behavioral public policy, uh, it's messing things even up further. But um, that's my personal take, but you know, but let, let's talk. Let's talk on the, about your higher up, um, uh, you know, point. Um, I absolutely agree. I mean, the, the, the literature, you know, that, and you you mentioned socialization, literature on socialization, literature on, in, in pedagogy, you know, on critical thinking, all sorts of things. And there's a rich literature outside, you know, BPP that makes exactly these points. And, and I actually think BPP should take this literature much more seriously uh, mm -hmm. and, and connect uh, with, um, you, know, you know, let's say how we think about, you know, educational institutions, um, um, not so much by having micro interventions such as boost and assistive queuing, but much more, you know, the, you know, literature in, in pedagogy, pedagogical literature on, on critical thinking. I think it's it's one where, you know, when we um, do behavioral public policy and think about public schools, it's, et cetera, we obviously can uh, take psychology seriously, um, you know, the self-determination literature, for example, on autonomy and, and competence, and go into schools and, and, and try to redesign school curricula uh, that is very different from um, you know, the type of uh, discussions we currently have in BPP. Uh, it's much more institutional. It's much more embedded uh, in a you know, age old literature actually uh, being informed by liberal first principles. So I'm absolutely in line with you. And ultimately, I hope it doesn't lead to that, to the, you know, that ultimately BPP is dissolved in, into these older literatures. But I think uh, it should take uh, those, um, uh, those aspects much more seriously. Uh, and I, I doubt that, you know, uh, and that this is my gentle pushback against your point, that the way DC and Ryan think about autonomy uh, and competence, and the third category that they have is social relatedness, is particularly novel. I mean, they, you know, they are explicit in, in the way they want to connect it to eudaimonic uh, con uh, conception of well-being that has been around for more than 2,000 years, obviously, <laughs> in the Aristotelian tradition. But I'm just... I don't think actually, maybe the way I presented it uh, sounded uh, sounded so novel, but I actually, I really think the type of terminology also um, people use in, in, in SDT is very um, conducive to these other languages that you actually mentioned. And by the way, SDT, oh, are you still there? Sorry. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, losing you little, we're losing you a little bit more too, unless it's my computer i think is it sorry i think uh my internet is i think i'm back right but sorry yeah. for that yeah i think you're okay yeah man. okay Go on, well, did, you, did you want to finish on a note there or? uh no no thank you uh others can have a go thank you okay uh sean Hi, Malte. Hi. I, 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 I just wanted to return to your exchange actually with Bob in, in a sense and, and uh, make an, an observation that's partly a question. And that is to say that whilst I, I absolutely agree with the, the, the thought that um, in some sense autonomy is an entirely subjectivist concept, I, it does seem to me that there is also a, a uh, well, to my mind, at least, <laughs> that for it to map into um, a policy framework, that does have to be some kind of third party perspective that's occurring. But I don't think it's the third party perspective that Bob, I thought, was alluding to with the idea that there might, as it were, be uh, some notion of what authentic ends might be that people should be, as it were, progressing to or something like that through these reflections. But what, what, I don't think it's anything like that. But what I do think the third party perspective does entail is a view with respect to what kinds of resources people need in order to engage in the kinds of reflections that lead to yeah. that subjective sense of autonomy. And I think that is a third party perspective that, uh, as it were, there has to be some kind of agreement about across individuals and within society and indeed it is the kinds of resources and the opportunities that one needs to be able to do that and so i think that is a third party perspective but it's not at the level that bob was suggesting yeah th thanks for that um uh, I, I i agree with you i mean think uh, you know obviously when when you say um Apart from, you know, Paul, Paul's intervention, you know, oh, these things, you know, are, are commonsensical and have been studied for, for, for many centuries and, 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 and are pretty clear. I think actually, you know, if you have sort of an empirically informed account of autonomy and competence, you obviously have, let's say, you know, psychologists, behavioral economists and other quote unquote experts studying that and saying, you know, what are now resources and institutional environments that are conducive to this sense of autonomy and competence, you obviously inject a third party perspective into a discourse that ultimately needs to be open to, you know, uh, you know, deliberation and, and democratic discussion, et cetera. But it's true. It's not just, you know, whatever people think we just go along with, you obviously want to inform people uh, by, you know, uh, alluding to some empirical insights, which could be constructed as a third party perspective. That then is open to uh, to the democratic process, right? But I think it's important, right? It's not purely um, subjectivist in that sense, right? You want to inform the policy discussion by alluding to certain criterion that you present to uh, to political discourse. And and by the way, this is you know Bob, Bob is obviously um, you know a Buchanan fan, uh, and, and Buchanan also said, you know, what is the role of the political economist here? What is the role of the B BPP analyst, it's of course more than just alluding to people's um, you know, subjective sense on whatever, right? We know that people think all sorts of stuff, but is informing people about the sensibility of a certain criterion. And then ultimately you need to convince them that it's a good criterion, right? But in that sense, there is a third party element that I think is, um, if we think, for example, about you know the, the point that Bob doesn't like authenticity, non-alienation, and of course that's not something that I tell people or you know other people, you know the political economist tells people, oh this is an authentic goal or this is a goal that is non-alienating, but to say you know authenticity and non-alienation are important ingredients for people's sense of autonomy. So let's let's have you know a discussion on that and let's try to construct our institutions that take these uh, that these um these aspects seriously and i particularly think uh, about educational institutions by the way um and i i can uh, think of many uh, examples in, in my own life but also from reading the literature where people are really struggling uh with institutional environments because the goals that they're pursuing are actually not self-authentically endorsed goals and ultimately 
um, when people turn 40, um, they, they have this awakening, often a, a bad awakening uh, through burnouts, et cetera, uh, because they, they wonder what, what the heck uh, have I tried to achieve uh, in, in the last 15 years of my life, right? And I think these types of discussions can be empirically informed and uh, can be injected into public policy considerations. And in that sense, there is a third party um, element, of course, in, in these discussions uh, that but that ultimately is alluding to people's subjective, um, you know, uh, endorsement of, of of those of those points. Right. Um, and I, I don't know whether this is sort of what you had in mind, Sean, but I, I, I very much think about these uh, these aspects and about behavioral public policy. Uh, that a third party perspective can enrich subjective reasoning processes. No, I, I, I agree entirely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Kristen, um, you can come back in. Uh, okay. I just have a, a kind of a quick uh, comment um, in kind of response to, so you can relax a little bit, Malte, unless you want to respond to it, um, to Paul's. Um, I will relax. I will relax on that. Yeah. <laughs> to Paul's saying, I think um, it just want to touch on our oh, response. Okay. <laughs> okay, you can see things. One is, um, I think one of my personal things working kind of in healthcare, working for healthcare providers is I sometimes think there's an over reliance or they put uh, neuroscience in fields that are not actually medicine has this idea that we can explain a lot more mm -hmm. than is possible. Because if you go back to the actual neurologist or say, when you're going into this, you realize the, how much is still kind of unknown. So there mm -hmm. can be a false perception, I think, on that. So I just want, mm -hmm. I, I've seen, read a lot of articles or things explaining kind of relationships um, sometimes in the social sciences, but knowing in actual medicine, when you work with the doctors, you're still very, very limited and you can't act upon anything. And that's not really something that's in, in practice. Um, I think to the other point on kind of things being around and kind of new words, um, and perhaps this is because I was reading again about Kuhn and Popper more recently and going into the philosophy. I think that sometimes that's just is reflective. I mean, I, I really, concepts can be around for a long time. I mean, we should get someone from Greece on here, really. Um, and it's just different words can reflect perhaps the time or the space that you're in. And it doesn't necessarily, I think the paradigms or the, the word paradigms that we have necessarily have to exclude the other. And that's kind of where I feel like you know, sometimes people feel like these things aren't physics per se, right? They are socially constructed. So mm -hmm. in that way, it's going to be what resonates in that time as it is. So it's a it's a bit of a kind of a abstract debate, but I think I always mm -hmm. want to separate kind of sometimes these hard physical sciences from sometimes the social constructions and trying to explain social things mm -hmm. in uh, statistical ways. So that that's my that's my comment led by my recent ratings. So thank you. Can, can I respond to that? <laughs> Since it's uh, oriented. Yeah. Is that okay, Adam? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So on, on, on the neuroscience thing, which is also, you know, I've, I've read a couple of books and this on that on it. Part of the point is to make people honest about how little of these psychological constructs can either be found in terms of how brains are or just how weird reasoning actually looks like if you look indeed at, at sort of what we know about brain functioning and how many uncertainties there are and so it, it takes away a lot of the seeming solidity of most of the concepts previously talked about even the notion of you know i the various notions of of what a person is and that then brings into question well what do you mean autonomy of whom what layer what perspective uh, what salient identity are we talking about um and so you're sort of making my point about the neuroscience thing, which is that if you come from that perspective, you, you suddenly start to think very differently about what part of the ground is solid uh, and what part of the ground is actually extremely shaky. Now, on this notion of language, um, I, I agree with you, you know, new generations try their own language, but these are existing fields. And so, yes, you can talk about enabling people's reasoning capacity, process facilitation, but, you know, most of the rest of the world calls that education, right? Uh, you can talk about fast and frugal decision trees, uh, and other people call it, you know, a, a quick thinking habit, right? Uh, and yes, you can call it queuing and boots, and other people call that pedagogy. So to a certain extent, it's it's a, almost a chosen form of self-alienation, 
to go away from those people who are doing this by not using their language, um, but by inventing a new one, which is essentially talking about the same stuff. So that's also my, my higher order question has to do with, well, does multi see connection? Or is yeah. he happy to be in a, you know, a, a, a totally separate group? Okay, can we leave that question? Uh, hang in for now, because I think that's a big debate. Um, yeah. I think out of most people that I know, multi tries, does try to embrace himself across various different disciplines. So I think, he, I think he's probably aware that, uh, you know, we do use the same language across different disciplines. I mean, but it's a big question. Um, should we be doing something about that, I guess? Uh, final question then, and then we'll need to finish for today, uh, is from Bob, or comment from Bob. It was just, it was really just a comment. I was thinking in, in terms of the, the listening to a multi, uh, I think there's two different, there's some of the time is thinking about sort of an, from a sort of individualistic subjective perspective of, you know, how does it feel to, what's the subjective experience or something. So, and some of the time it's a, uh, democracy i mean it's obviously that's another liberal value but this sort of, i mean i've seen this in you see this in sen the idea that you know, the, the dis difference between uh the kind of contract error or individualistic thought of what does each what does each person think is important to them and there's what we as a democratic community want to well we don't agree we're a kind of majority view as to what we what collectively we decide it matters mm -hmm. and it feels as though some of the time what multi saying isn't really this is what this is what each person this is not the concept of authenticity isn't really what each person what each person feels it's what after a political debate um the majority view is that this is what counts at it and i think we have to distinguish between democracy and and um individual subjectivity you know what i mean and i personally i would go on this tend to go on the side of the individual subjectivity rather than because it's set in a way if you sort of say well which would you rather which more important to you to have what you want or to play your part in a collective decision about what all of us want and you have to want what you know what has been collectively decided we want so thanks uh, can i can i just a 30 second response um yeah, yeah. To, to this uh, it's always my response that I give to Bob's remarks that are obviously very uh, thought provoking. You know, again, you know, looking at, at Buchanan, what Buchanan would say is, of course, I mean, he's in your camp, but he would also say the constitution of private man presupposes the constitution of public man. They tie into each other. I mean, and obviously communitarians, you know, from a completely different, uh, in a different literature would exactly make that point. I mean, we um, cannot think about, you know, the quality of individual reasoning processes without embedding it into, into wider social, um, you know, considerations. And in fact, in that sense, you know, things, and, and I think Sen makes that point, you know, thinking about freedom and agency ultimately is not just an, an individual category, but is obviously embedded in um, a discussion of the social and institutional environment, right? They they tie into each other it's almost like the same uh, the, the two sides of the same coin uh, i know that uh, you have your valid critique of, of this perspective but i think actually buchanan also saw that uh, i mean he he's not thinking about the constitution and processes of self-constitution on the private level without also a, a serious concern of what's happening in in, in the public sphere remember that i'm not uh, i'm not buchanan's representative no, no, i know i'm allowed to disagree with him <laughs> well that's true Okay, I think we need to finish. Sorry, we've got a big truck outside the house, so I hope you can still hear me. Um, yeah, I mean, it just seems to me, it strikes me, I mean, it's something I wrote in my book uh, recently that, you know, there are, I, I can't decide what they are myself, I don't think, because I, I would always be afraid of crossing the boundary of being paternalistic. But there seems to me that there's, there's some level of foundational or primary goods or services that people need in order for them to, have the best chance to flourish and live a you know live a live a life that is that is as close to autonomous as we can make it really um and i think bob agrees with that as well i spoke to bob and he believes for instance that you need a certain level of income in order to function as a human being right and there must be other things as well i think that we can all reach it or most of us could reach a consensus on with education i think being um, you know, one of the old sort of um, anti-paternalistic values, wasn't it? Something that was very heavily uh, emphasised by 
uh, John Stuartman himself. Anyway, um, I think that these arguments are going to be ongoing. I just want to thank Malti today for presenting his work, which is, I think, really good, really great work as usual. And thank you all for your questions. This is the last seminar um, in this series, uh, sorry, in this academic year of this series. Uh, and we'll pick things up again in October, 